Okay, we are back. I am very happy to have back on the Goldstein on Gelt show, Professor Edmund Phelps, who's a professor of politi political economy at Columbia University and the director of Columbia's Center on Capitalism and Society. Ned, it's a pleasure to have you. Thanks a lot. It's good to be here. So listen, today we are talking about your upcoming book called Mass Flourishing, How Grassroots Innovation Created Jobs, Challenge, and Change. Can you tell us about it? Well, it's... Uh it's about um, the um, the birth of mass innovation and um, widespread prosperity, and it it asks how that happened in the early part of the 19th century, and uh, what happened in the second half of the 20th century uh, to bring that to an end <clears throat> in in, uh, in several nations. All right, so can you give us a little and, hint? And, uh, and uh, it, it, it starts by, by pointing out that this, the, the emergence of, um, of grassroots innovation didn't just produce rapid productivity growth for the first time in human history on a sustained basis. Uh, it, it, it changed the nature of work. It, it, it replaced routine jobs dull, tedious, lonely jobs, and replace them with, uh, with jobs that, that had problems to solve and, and uh, that were changing all the time. So they were um, mentally stimulating, intellectually challenging, and so forth. And, and, uh, and I, I argue that this was not science that was driving that. It was people... Uh, tinkering, thinking about better ways of producing things and new products to produce, right down to the grassroots of society. That was especially the case uh, in America. Mm -hmm. And um, so you, you got just this, it's, it's got an explosion of innovation and, and um, uh, a whole lot of uh, human happiness uh, out of that. And um, so the first thing, the, the first question I take up is, uh, well, what caused this? And I argue that it was uh, the slow uh, accretion of uh, some new human values that uh, came up uh, as early as uh, 1490, values that we usually call individualism and, and vitalism, thinking for yourself, working for yourself, exercising your creativity, exploring the unknown. And these are all ideas that are based on the freedoms that people were beginning to appreciate. Nothing changed in, in the human beings. Well, yeah, like people had to have the freedom for those things, but that comes later. I think the ideas came before the freedom came. And, and uh, <clears throat> of course, also the willingness to bear uncertainty and, and uh, the gumption to stand apart from your friends or your family or your community. That's all important. So that's that's what I argue is is the source of, of the of the birth of these modern economies in 1820s, 1830s, in the case of Britain and America, and later in the case of uh, France and Germany. And uh, then, and as everybody knows, something happened. Um, Britain and Germany seem to lose a lot of their dynamism by the end of the 1930s and certainly uh, by the end of the 1940s. In France, I think there's a, a lot big loss of dynamism by the by the end of the 1950s, and America, no less, also suffered a tremendous loss of dynamism in part because it had so much to lose. Uh, uh, around the end of the 60s, beginning of the 70s. And so that gets me off on, on the question, well, what, what's going on here? Did we lose those modern values? Well, I'm uh, not a, maybe you could just focus on yeah. this a little more, because my feeling has been, since, since I grew up and, and, uh, in New York and I had, uh, <clears throat> didn't even have a computer in my house, to my house now where we've got... You know, ten computers and phones and iPads. I mean, I feel that there's fabulous flourishing. 
There is fabulous flourishing, but it's in a narrow set of zip codes in California, and, <laughs> and, and maybe uh, in, in Israel. It's in the uh, canyons of Manhattan. It, you don't find it in the heartland. You don't find it on the train ride from New York to Washington. You don't find it in uh, Chicago <clears throat> or Detroit or or uh, the South. You're talking so, about specific areas where they may not be flourishing or, or innovating and having new jobs in the same way that we've seen in certain metropolitan centers, or again, I'll just add in Israel as well. Mm -hmm. What's the question? The, the question is, the, what you're identifying is something that's what you're identifying is something that is uh, that perhaps has changed or weakened in in the right. last half century doesn't right. seem to be happening everywhere and there are certain areas where <clears throat> where we continue to see a great expansion and in innovation uh, I, I guess I agree with that as, as I just said um, I, I, I do agree that uh, the the uh, there's a sliver sliver of land along the west coast of California uh, where uh, innovation is still going forward although there's seems to be a fair amount of muttering these days that even there the innovation has slowed down quite a bit huh. uh, but but I, I I'm talking about the country as a whole okay now I would say that Israel is an example where there seems to be a lot of innovating innovating going on and and and, and it um, I was speaking to somebody just a few weeks ago who had just come back from Israel, and she said to me that it's just like you said, everybody is involved in it. it everybody is uh, tinkering or thinking about new products or new methods in Israel. Um, so you're the new America. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, okay. I don't know. I don't know whether you think that's <laughs> right. I, I don't know. I do feel certainly that. Uh, that the amount of innovation that, that's coming from Israel, you know, you look at a website like Israel 21C, which is uh, talks about Israel in the 21st century, yeah. every day there are new high-tech companies, and not only high-tech, it seems that it's even in low-tech and, and in agriculture and banking, but yes. I, I, I'm sure that Israel is not the only one. We are talking with... Ned no, I think Israel is the only one. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. We're talking with Nobel Prize winner Edmund Phelps, who's a professor of political economy at Columbia University. He's the director of Columbia's Center on Capitalism and Society. And he's uh, next, in the end of August, beginning of September, his book is coming out called Mass Flourishing, How Grassroots Innovation Created Jobs, Challenge, and Change. But he argues in the book that perhaps there is much less innovation now than there was in the recent past which is a little bit of a, I think, a shock for many people. How has your thesis been taken? For me? How have people How? accepted your, your, your theory? Because it sounds a little bit radical. Well, economists are, don't, don't have any problem with the facts of the matter. The facts of the matter are that productivity growth ground almost to a halt around 1972. And, and it never came back except for one... Uh, with the principal exception being the period during the build-out of the Internet from around 1996 to around 2004. But after that, it's right back to a very sleepy time with very, very, very slow growth of productivity. In fact, it's, it's, it's almost dire now. I mean, it just, uh, in the past year or two, we see very little growth of productivity. There was a time when productivity was growing at 3% per annum. And then you threw in 1% uh, growth of the labor force, and that delivered a growth in GDP of 4%. We're, we're miles from that now. So just to clarify, the productivity you're talking about is an economic <coughs> calculation as opposed to what I was referring to, which was the innovation that we're seeing. Well, sure, but, but, the, but, but the productivity growth is, is the first line of evidence we have of what's happening to innovation. Mm -hmm. If we get a big slowdown of productivity, it's pretty likely to, to, to uh, indicate uh, a big slowdown of, of innovation. Okay. I'm wondering if it's a difference in terms of efficiency, but again, I, I'm maybe it's simply because I'm oh, living oh, in the heart sure. of this. Yeah, I, I can go with that. Yeah. I mean, the, uh, there's not a tight link between 
innovation, the rate of innovation and the rate of growth of productivity. Sure, there's some slack there, but uh, <clears throat> if you have uh, high innovation year after year, this is bound to lead to, to rapid growth of productivity sooner or later. <clears throat> Okay, I bet I, I, I should probably get to the punchline of the <clears throat> interview question, which, because we're running out of time, but I'm, I think yeah. this is what you have to answer is, yeah. okay, assuming that that's what's going on or has been going on, what can we do to, to reverse that trend? Well, I think what's been going on is not that we've lost the modern values. I think people uh, still have curiosity, uh, still love novelty, still want to explore all that. But I think that all sorts of other values have crept in. Family values, all sorts of, uh, uh, of uh, other uh, traditional values um, have, have crept in. And uh, as a result, uh, the modern values are not getting the space that they used to get to... to, to uh, to spur uh, in innovation, and um, it's a tough thesis to to um, to set out because the the evidence, you know, is catch and catch can. But uh, w we do have some clinical evidence, so to speak, from from household surveys that that suggests that family values are on the rise. And that means the kids ought to stay close to home. They shouldn't go out into out tens of thousands of miles into the world. Uh, they should stay close to home. They should support the family. And, and that so and that hurts innovation. Is that the theory? Oh sure, my goodness! You uh, uh, <clears throat> when Marconi invented the the wireless. Uh, he had to get away from the detractors and the naysayers and everything. He went to London. Um, and as far as I know, Marconi was not an overly sensitive person. He just didn't have the feel the uh, cultural freedom to, to, uh, to be doing something different. Again, and, I, uh, I find that funny simply because my experience here, I do think that Israel is a, is a rather traditional society. And, you know, even when you look in in the religion, you know, particularly religious, very pro-family kind of uh, or, uh, culture here, it, it is it is walking in lockstep with uh, you know the high-tech heroes. So I, I don't I don't see necessarily why the two counter each other. That's all. You think that the children have to to stay close to? Do, do the children have to stay close to home? I mean, that's that's the tradition. That's that's. It, well, it's it a tradition, but are, are they obeying the tradition? <clears throat> I, I don't see that. Obviously, there are Israelis around the world, but they <clears throat> seem to, to come home when it's time to, uh, to to do their work and to build their companies. I mean, look at companies like Teva and uh, and uh, Checkpoint. And, you know, mm -hmm. it, these are all homegrown well, companies. I'm not saying you have to leave the country in order to innovate. No, on, on the contrary. Israel is, Israel is an example of a country that has been innovating at home. <clears throat> um, but um, I would think that um, I would think that the Israelis are um, a very modern bunch uh, that have been all over the world, very cosmopolitan, uh, <clears throat> full of considerable um, individualism and vitalism. I don't think that uh, yeah, okay, they have the uh, religious tradition and they have uh, strong families, I suppose. But, but uh, um, I, I don't, um, <clears throat> you haven't convinced me that, uh, that uh, uh, Israel is a very conservative, stay at home, uh, mind the children kind of place. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, maybe next time I will convince you. Unfortunately, <laughs> we are just about out of time. We've been talking to Professor Edmund Phelps. He is the director of Columbia's Center on Capitalism Society. Uh, he teaches at uh, Political Economy at Columbia. He's
He was the 2006 Nobel Prize winner in economics, and probably most famously is that he is a repeat customer on the Goldstein <laughs> on Geld show. Ned, we are just about out of time, but in the last few seconds, could you tell people how can they follow you or get your new book? Uh, the book should be out in August. I think it's already just about out in Europe, and it will in a couple, two or three weeks be uh, out in uh, the United States. Um, I buy my books at Amazon.com, but I, <laughs> <laughs> I, but I also uh, worship uh, bookstores, <laughs> and uh, I, I, uh, I like that uh, the, the bookstore should have it about the same time. All right. And uh, I, I'm looking forward to uh, going around the world talking about it. Okay, well, we hope that we'll get to see you here in Israel. Professor Edmund Phelps, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. You've been listening to the Goldstein on Gelt Show with money maven Doug Goldstein. Doug's weekly radio show is heard around the world, but if you miss it, you can download the podcast at www.goldsteinongelt.com. The Goldstein on Gelt Show gives you up-to-date financial ideas so you can get on the path to financial freedom. If you'd like your questions answered on the air or off, send Doug an email to doug at profile-financial.com. It's your money for your future, so join Doug every week to build your wealth on the Goldstein on Gelt Show.